Hello and welcome back everybody. This is Nathan Crane, founder of the Panacea Community and executive producer of Unify Fest. And I want to thank you for joining us again for the second annual Self-Reliance Summit. This summit is dedicated to helping each of us build skills for this new world of sustainable living that we're all a part of. And today I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker, Lori Neverman. From green building to wild crafting, Lori mixes the best of traditional skills and modern tech with a twist of humor to present self-sufficiency information in a way that makes sense to everyone. Lori is the founder of Common Sense Homesteading and provides valuable resources and information for living a more self-reliant lifestyle. Lori, thanks so much for being with us. Hey, great. It's great to see you again, Nate. Absolutely. So today we're going to be talking about one of my just absolute favorite subjects, which is permaculture and what you're calling the permaculture revolution. So, Lori, let's start first by laying the foundation of understanding of what permaculture really is. Well, depending on who you talk to, of course, there's uh, quite a number of different interpretations. But basically, we're looking at uh, the, the love child of permanent and agriculture or permanent and culture. Uh, so, you know, coming up with permaculture. So you're looking at creating a system that is largely self-supporting, that it works as a cooperative uh, arrangement between all the different facets of what's planted, uh, humans in the environment, the buildings, the water features, everything works together in a synergistic relationship to create something greater than the whole, to enrich the earth, provide for humans, and hopefully create a surplus to give back. Right. And, you know, the big buzzword in people in sustainability today is regenerative, right? It's, it's just changing the consciousness a little bit about regenerating the land, regenerating the food systems, making them really self-sustained. I mean, sustainability already means regenerative because it means something that can continue indefinitely, which means forever, which means it would have to be regenerative to continue forever. But there's a lot of corporations using sustainable as a way to market themselves when they're not sustainable, as we know. So we're using terms regenerative. But really what, what you're talking about is, is permaculture is, is an amazing system, right, for using regenerative principles as well as many other principles to, to live in harmony with the land and our environment, our community, so that it can continue, you know, hopefully indefinitely. Yeah? Uh, you know, absolutely. You know, we found evidence, you and I are talking a little bit about this, that um, the Native American tribes in North America practice a form of permaculture for thousands of years, you know, working with perennial crops, trees, different plants that grow that would uh, grow along their different migration lines as they move with the animals, as they move through the forest. And they worked with the crops, you know, people originally at least when i was in school we were taught that oh it was a giant untamed land well it was anything but it was a living working ecosystem agriculture you know they were working with the land and tending those perennial crops working with the animal herds to provide for the needs of the tribe without damaging it you know we had beautiful topsoil developed here and and, you know, since we switched to what's currently called conventional agriculture, you know, we've seen that blowing off into the ocean. So it's it's basically things are starting to finally come full circle, for which I am very pleased, you know, working with the natural processes to provide for us and provide for the land. You know, I was in Costa Rica recently filming for our next documentary series, and I, I was going to different farms and I recognize, you know, permaculture, and I was like, hey, well, you guys are doing permaculture. You know about that, huh? And they're like, permaculture, what's that? <laughs> and, yeah. and it was funny because I was like, oh, well, yeah, duh. You know, a lot of these people that have lived on the land, you know, dependent on the land, working, growing their food on the land for many, many generations, have already known and implemented things like, you know, planting nitrogen-fixing plants to your 
to your trees, your fruit trees, your orchards, things like that. Companion planting, uh, the famous corn, beans, and squash. The, you know, bringing in pollinator flowers so they make sure the bees come and, and moths and butterflies help pollinate everything. Like these are principles that indigenous communities have known forever. How they figured it out, I don't know, probably just through observation. But um, I mentioned permaculture and they're just like, well, no, yeah, I don't really know what that is. But obviously permaculture is a design science that took, you know, Bill Mollison and the other Australian dude that put together this whole system and said, look at all these great, you know, sustainable, regenerative principles um, that people have done forever. Let's make it into a design science that could be really, you know, Paul Wheaton is a good friend of mine. And one of the interviews I've done with him, you know, I agree with what he says. He says, you know, permaculture really, if you look at it, provides pretty much all the solutions to all the major crises we're facing on the planet today. And that's a pretty big statement, right? I mean, that's huge. So what's been it's your... It's a pretty big... Yeah, it's a pretty big statement, but I, I think that's... And I, I have Matt Powers. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to work with Matt at all. He's... Uh, got his new series, The Permaculture Student, where he's working on textbooks. He started out with uh, junior high, and now he's got a high school textbook that he's working on a Kickstarter for. Nice. And um, he says the big thing is looking permaculture that's different from others. Like the sol the problem is the solution, right? As opposed to okay, we have, for instance, like grasshoppers attacking this field. Like oh, we have terrible amounts of insects. Well, okay, so how can we use that to our advantage? You could potentially eat the insects yourselves, which, uh, you know, most people don't necessarily find too appealing. But, you know, in a lot of areas of the world, it's perfectly okay and, and you know, thought is delicious. Or you can do things, you could introduce critters like uh, chickens, guineas, quail, whatever, you know, suits your area and let them eat the critters. And then you harvest the meat or the eggs or the, you know, everything from that. So you can't um, just categorically say, ah, oh, this, this is horrible. I have the situation. I can't farm that. I can't do that. It's like, well, how can I use that to my advantage? How can I build on that is, is one of the key principles. And then uh, another example, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, restoration, restoration agriculture and new forest farm. That's over on the other side of Wisconsin. Um, Mark Shepard has done amazing things. He's got over a hundred acres. It was beat up farmland. The, the area over there is all rolling hills. And so it had been farmed conventionally. They stripped off the topsoil and it, it was just worn out farmland. He got it back in the eighties. He's gone the permaculture route. He's restored this farmland. He's harvesting apples. He's harvesting nuts. He's harvesting mushrooms. He's got um animals in there he's got honey he's you know he's now from this dead farmland harvesting a multitude of crops uh, you know so it it's just so different from conventional ag where it's just more static and you know not regenerative you know to, to use that catchphrase so right well and um you know, one of the other great principles I love about permaculture is stacking functions. And, and I find myself, yeah. <laughs> as, I, as I learn more about permaculture, I find myself um, that I have been naturally using a lot of these principles in my own life and in our businesses mm -hmm. and organizations and things like that as well. Or as I learn more about them, I'm finding new ways to use some of these principles. And, you know, stacking functions, for example, it's great for food systems. It's also great for your life, for your family. Right. An example, going back to the ground birds, chickens, mm -hmm. right? Chickens, people think, oh, I have chickens just for eggs or I have chickens just for meat, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever their, their thought is about chickens. But think about what chickens can really do. You put them in a fruit orchard, they'll go in and scratch up the dirt. They'll help, you know, because they're looking for worms and critters. So they're going to help break it up. They're going to put their, their uh, feces everywhere. So put nitrogen into the soil. They're going to eat grass and Weeds growing up you might not want there. They're going to eat, you know, if you have excess grasshoppers or insects that are attacking your fruit orchard. And then plus you have eggs. You know, if you eat meat, you have meat. In my family, we don't eat meat, but our dogs do. So, you know, we feed the chickens to the dogs. And our table scraps, all of our, our, all of our veggies, all of our fruit peels, all of that 
goes right to the compost pile next to the chickens and they get to eat from that. So we have this closed loop production cycle. So you just start thinking of all these different ways to stack functions with one core thing, like with your garden, with your chickens, with, and then in your own life, right? How can I stack functions in, in my work or uh, with my family, right? We tend to think very linear, which is where this monocropping came from with conventional agriculture, mm -hmm. but this is more of a more of a creative poly type of thinking where you're starting to look at things from, from a bigger spectrum, right? I think that's what permaculture encompasses really well. Yeah, the stacking functions, it, it, at first it might seem a little bit strange, but as soon as you start looking at it, it's just like pieces of the puzzle coming together because nothing lives in a vacuum and you know, no man is an island, nothing lives in a vacuum. But looking at like the chickens, I don't know if you're familiar with Justin Rhodes and his permaculture chickens videos he's, and uh, all his products. Yeah. He's, he's one of the presenters. He is. He is. He's on the summit. All right. All yeah. right yeah. Everybody watching, Just, check yeah. him out after this interview. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Justin's great. We become friends and he introduced himself a few months ago or himself a few months ago and we become friends and it's just really great, you know, working, he calls them his mini dinos, his chickens and you know, like aerating the compost and different things. But like even in our home, you know, that's not food production, but you know, we have, you can kind of see a little bit here. I'm in what's well, a computer room and we have um, massive windows, which provide a lot of daylighting. But that's, it's also set up for passive solar. So we've got um, an overhang and the correctly sized windows on the south side of our house. Well, that also creates a microclimate underneath our deck. It's a, two, it's a walkout basement. So there's a deck that acts as an overhang for the lower level. Underneath that deck, it creates a, a dry, warm microclimate. So we cure and store our firewood there, you know, or it's um, out of the snowfall and whatnot. We also use that deck area as a great little laundry hanging area. We put up the laundry hanger there. So the clothes are out of the, the wind a little bit, at least enough to keep them from wrapping around the line quite too much. And it's really convenient. I can just step out and it's right there. And, you know, so it started as one thing, but can build, you know, all these little things come together. And then it's a beautiful spot to just sit out and admire that gorgeous garden too. That's out to the south. So, you know, it, it when you start thinking about it, it's like, oh, how could I, use this for that. And it's just fun. You know, I, I think once people get into it and start digging a little bit, it's like, oh yeah, I could do this. I could build it. So I, it's just, uh, you know, a ton of opportunities and a ton of different ways to use things that we kind of tend to take for granted. So yeah. Yeah. One example of, uh, of another thing in permaculture I love is like guilds, you know, working with guilds, mm -hmm. especially in planting. Um, you know, a guild for, for anybody who doesn't know, obviously it's a, it's a community of, you know, living, symbiotic, supportive, collaborative community. And so if you think of a guild, you know, you could have a social networking guild all around, you know, chess. If you love chess, maybe that's your chess guild or, if you, you know, you're a runner or, a, you know, organic gardener. You can have people guilds, social guilds, community guilds, but we also apply that to, to food systems, right? And one example, like I'm building a, a, a guild, a, a food forest um, with companion planting here in our backyard. And so I planted about a dozen or so different varieties of fruit trees. And I just went in now that we've got the snow kind of melted away and stuff and just planted um, some nitrogen fixing plants in between them and around them, some berry bushes, which is going to make a nice kind of border and wall as well as, you know, berries like to have shade so you plant them underneath like a fruit tree for example um, you know you're working with pollinators you're working with ground cover you know you're creating this symbiotic system rather than just this monocrop where you have to go and you have to weed all the time you have to water all the time you have to fertilize all the time it's about creating that living system where it all takes care of itself and supports itself it, it nutrifies itself with nitrogen you know, the plants that need shade, they get shade. Uh, ground cover helps the soil to retain the water, so you don't have to water as much. In some cases, not at, at all, if you do it right. So that's another one. I, I mean, I love the the concept of guilds. Um, have you have you had any mm -hmm. have you had any good experience in working with with guilds at all? 
Well, we're just kind of getting started. I, I really started going a little bit more in the permaculture direction just last year. So we had these established plantings, and now we're kind of coming back and backfilling with things. But nice. we've got a, a fruit tree area, and one of our big projects for last year is there's this south-facing hill that I would have thought would have made a great area for planting grapes. There's actually a vineyard just like two miles east of us. It's called Parallel 44. And, you know, we're at that same latitude where some of the great vineyards over in Europe are at. And we've got that kind of uh, mixed, like hard scrabble type soil that, you know, you don't want it too rich for your grapevines because then you don't get that proper terroir, right? Um, but anyway, so I had my grapes on my south facing hill and I thought, okay, great spot. Not for us because I've got a north wind, just the way our, our, uh, landscape flows, the north wind would come over our driveway, scour that poor hill, and kill off my grapes every winter. So it's like, oh, wow. what do I do? <laughs> so what we ended up doing there is last year, we have country neighbors. He has his own backhoe storing the, the tool shed. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, he came over last spring, and we sculpted swales into that hillside. Nice. And the grapes that had looked almost dead before the swales were put in, came back to life. And then we filled in other plantings on those swales. We've got um, very, a variety of mints, clovers, different things that are supportive. And then we're putting in different uh, small to medium sized tr shrubs, depending. And so we're, we're building that into a whole verdant ecosystem on what was just barren hillside for the last uh, 10 years now. And it, it's just amazing how everything is working together. And, you know, it's not drying out now, though. The swales are, uh, for those who don't aren't familiar with swales, um, basically you have sort of a mound system and with a trough behind it, and it follows the contours of the hill, going down the hill. So you're catching the water on the hillside as opposed to just letting it run on down the hill. And they can do amazing things for transforming environments. And... You know, since the swales have put in, and that last fall, that was so green and lush, and we're just been barren, and yeah, everything working together. It's just, I'm, I'm so excited to be able to get out there again this year. We cleared it off when we had some warm weather, but the last two weeks, as I mentioned, we've been stuck in snow, so waiting to get out there again. Nice. Yeah, no, that's a great, great thing for people to know, and I mean, digging swales on contour, it just, it collects the rainwater, soaks it into the roots. Um, like Paul Wheaton, he's up at his place, he's got a bunch of swells dug and they actually, as they build their mounds, they layer them as hugel cultures. So inside they're layering, you know, huge, uh, blocks of, uh, uh, trunks of trees and limbs and branches. So it's going to break down and, and nutrify and store water and all of that too. So there's creative things you can do with swells that make it even more regenerative and more sustainable. And then you have, you know, Sepp Holzer who really works a lot with the terraces. And um, I'm building three of these right now. We're doing a whole food system where basically I'm working on capturing the, I've been paying attention for the last year. That's the other important thing is wherever you live, wherever you're you know, implementing permaculture, spend time observing the environment and how water flows and you know, um, mm -hmm. where the winds come from, like, like you got to experience and yeah, you know, in the yeah. winter when everything loses its leaves, uh, you know, where's the light coming in. And I, that's what I did. I spent almost a year here first before I started planting almost anything, just observing the seasons, the cycles, the water. Now I've got uh, a very good visual as to the different food systems that I'm putting in. And one of them is, you know, capturing rainwater from the driveway. It actually runs down to the back side of the property and so be you know trenching that and putting rocks in it and, and helping that water scoot along down where I'll have three terraces you know just as you can imagine a terrace and in those terraces what what is really great too is you can build swells in the terraces plant your trees plant your systems plant your companion plants your bushes but all of it so that on the terrace um, I forget the degree of slope you're supposed to have um, but there's a, like a two or three degree something slope that you build so that it if that terrace fills up if that swell fills up it's going to run down around to the next one down below and down to the next one below and then 
that's going to run right into our pond. So if that ever fills up enough with enough water, which we would need massive amount of water to do that. But if it does, then it's going to, the overflow is just going to go into the pond anyway, which is where we want it. But in the meantime, all those trees and everything's going to collect all that water and feed it on its way down. So I, I love terraces too. I mean, they're, they're, they're easy ways to, to create beautiful, sustainable food systems. <clears throat> so let's talk yeah, about... Yeah, you mentioned... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> you mentioned Sepp Holzer. I haven't... I just started researching some of his work, and I'm really looking forward to reading his book soon. Um, one of the things that he... I just saw that he was doing is he's growing citrus in a, an environment that's similar to what we've got here, which is just phenomenal to me. And that's that's one of the things that you know, would just never be possible with conventional ag because you don't bend the rules. It's like, well, what grows here in your zone is what grows in your zone. One of the coolest things that I've seen implemented with the different permaculture installations is, you know, bending those rules in, on what you can grow, you know, creating microclimates working again with the swales, with water elements, with the uh, rock walls and uh, all these different elements to create microclimates and really extend the opportunities for what you can grow. I mean, Sepp is producing citrus in Austria and in the, mountain, um, in the mountains. Yeah. Where it gets. Yeah. 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 Alpine citrus. Who, yeah. Maybe it's going to be a new thing. <laughs> and, and then, you know, and then they've been greening the deserts, uh, you know, with the use of swales in the middle East. It's just where there was nothing now there's a lush oasis. It, right. It's just phenomenal that the transformations that can be accomplished with this. Exactly. Yeah. And, and Sepp Holzer, for those watching, I mean, he doesn't consider himself a, perma, a permaculturist at all. He, he's kind of a, those, yeah. those who follow Sepp Holzer, it's a, a Holzer culture, I think. Is what Holzer culture. Yeah, he's got, he's, kind of he's his got own, his own, he's got his own thing like going on, but he's doing some really, yeah. really amazing stuff. Um, for sure. Yeah. Great person to check out, you know, um, Paul Wheaton's doing some amazing stuff. Jeff Lawton, he's the one, you know, doing the, the systems in the desert that you're speaking of. Um, I mean, all really great, great people, but you know, it, it's fun like yourself where we're going out and actually experimenting with these things and getting experience. And then, you know, like you're doing sharing with people because that's how we learn. We can learn from other people's mistakes and other people's successes, but then really go out and just try it and do it and, and share. Like I love your network, your community, because you've, you've got a great blog, you've got a great social uh, presence and community. So you're always posting things as you're, as you're sharing them and, and teaching others. I think that's really valuable. So, so thank you for doing that. And, um, and going, going to the next, you know, kind of the next gear I want to kick into here is about the soil. Um, you know, we hear now, obviously, we have depleted so much of the topsoil in this country, in the United States, and now it's happening in other countries as well that have switched to this modern, I don't even like to call it conventional, but, you know. I call it chem-ag. Chem -ag, destructive yeah. agriculture, you know, whatever. Um, uh, yeah, corporate agriculture, right? So it's for profits, mm -hmm. not for people. Anyway, that are switching to that, they're also losing their topsoil. And, um, and that, you know, any culture that does not respect its topsoil disappears. And there's studies that's been done on this. The, the civilizations that did not respect their topsoil, they end up become, you know, being destroyed because you can't live. If you're, if you're someone who eats food, you're not a breatharian, a monk in the mountains somewhere that doesn't need food. If you need food, you have to have healthy, thick, abundant rich topsoil and it can take hundreds of years to rebuild topsoil unless mm -hmm. you're doing permaculture systems so, so maybe you can talk about how it heals the soil yeah I, like you said unless unless you take dramatic steps i know matt uh you know he's out in cali and he's got steep hillsides and when he first moved out there, you know, people were warning him because well, they the, there's the deer and there's the, the the hillsides like to wash away in Cali because there's a lot of disturbed earth and tectonic and instability. So when he put in swales, he's working with it, and he says he's got areas now, and he's only been working with it, you know, a handful of years. He's got thick, nice topsoil in a matter of years with the permaculture plantings, which you know you're not. I compare that looking around our countryside. I live out, um, we're on 35 acres in the country, surrounded by farmland. It's, you know, the breadbasket of America. 
And in the winter, the snowfield ditches, I can see the topsoil blowing off the fields into the ditch. You know, I can see it washing away in the rain. It, and it just, it's sad and frustrating to me because the soil is not protected at all for so much. Well, once that crop comes off in the fall or late summer, that's it. It's like, well, that's it. You know, okay. Their version of conventional ag care is, well, we, we have nutrient management, which means they spray the poop on there. You know, we've got lots and lots of uh, dairy farms around here, the big ag dairy farms and, you know, liquid manure sprayed every and the DNR. Oh, this ticks me off. But the DNR just gave them permission to use irrigation equipment to spread the liquid manure, which mm. is going to aerosolize the manure. And you want to bet there's going to be more people with breathing issues and just oh, oh, wow. beyond frustrating. You know, it's like they won't let the compost grown tomatoes aren't safe. You know, using cut using uh you know raw milk isn't safe but yet they can aerosolize manure and tell me it's safe no it's just you know people who are watching this probably get it it just ticks me off but anyway the big thing with permaculture is a very important part of your design elements is looking at including those elements that help repair the soil like using plants that are bioaccumulators, even common weeds. People are like, oh my gosh, I got so many weeds. Well, the weeds are there as a pioneer species to help rebuild the soil. That's how nature works. It's not a random thing. Those weed seeds can lay dormant in the soil for decades, maybe even hundreds of years until they get the right, right conditions where they are needed and then they come to life and they work to rebuild the soil. And they will accumulate various nutrients in their tissues. And then when they die off, they return that to the soil. Um, most people are familiar with legumes. You know, your peas, your beans, your nitrogen fixers. But one thing that I learned about that I had no idea about um, until I started studying permaculture was looking at the nitrogen fixing trees and shrubs, which are very commonly used in permaculture. I had no idea that trees and shrubs could do that too. It's just... Oh, you know, why, why isn't this being used? We have um, autumn olives growing wild all over our place. Mm -hmm. Well, we started using them. They're a nitrogen fixer. So we've started using them as part of our guilds, planting our new trees next to the existing autumn olive trees. So the autumn olives can actually help feed and nurture the new uh, regular fruit trees that are going in. You know, it, it's just so many things that are there are just waiting for us to take advantage of and you know it's like not mentioned not even considered in conventional ag yeah well gardening well, well they haven't figured out how to monetize it and profitize yeah, it as exactly. much as they like to yet you know so that's but but the cool thing is is that we get to empower ourselves to do this stuff and, and take back control of our food supply that's like what really also excites me but you mentioned something really uh, i had a great experience here on our land, as I said, I sat with the land and, and observed it for about a year. And, um, you know, we had these huge, massive weeds. I mean, they were like four feet tall, you know, four, four and a half feet tall. And they just grow so prolifically. Um, and I forget what they were called. It's here. We're in the Southwest high desert climate. It's like, it's not Kota, but it's something like that. It was brought in as a um, it was brought in, you know, they call it invasive species, brought in from Europe here as a cattle uh, uh, feed and that sort of thing as a grazing for grazing animals. Um, but it just spreads like they have million, one plant has like millions of seeds. It just spreads everywhere like crazy. <clears throat> but I didn't pull it all out right away. I just sat with it and observed it. It was like, what is this function? What's it doing? What, what can I learn about it? Maybe it's edible. Maybe it's medicinal. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe my, uh, maybe my goats like it. Maybe they'll eat it, you know, that sort of thing. So it was like, um, just observing, paying attention. And then as, as I did start realizing, okay, I definitely want this food system here and I don't want those weeds there because I'm going to put in nitrogen fixers, <laughs> specific plants I want. I went in and started pulling them out. Man, those things had roots like the size of the Empire State Building. They were, they they were so good for the soil that I realized. I said, "Look how amazing these weeds are." Because the family member like, "You got to get rid of those now. They're taking over everything. Why do you want those?" And I'm like, "Just leave it alone." <laughs> I started taking them out, and that soil. I mean, I could literally, I could just push a shovel down, 
and pull it up. I mean, they spread open that soil so nicely. And then five feet away where there were no weeds, you take a shovel and it's like, you know, pounding through clay. Hard pan, hard yes, pan. Yes, yep. you know, and that's another function is paying attention to those kinds of plants around your area that are that are stacking functions. Those weeds are there, they're breaking up the soil. You know, a lot of times they're, they're bringing nutrients from down below, bringing it to the top. You know, so they, they have such great functions that we just look at it and go, oh, they're weeds, we got to get rid of them. It's like, no, sometimes they're your best friends. You got to learn what they're doing to support so you don't have to do as much backbreaking work, right? Um, yeah, that reminds me of something that Mark Shepard says in his book that we need to stop trying to grow what wants to die and trying to kill what wants to live. If you work with what, what, what wants to grow there, you're generally going to end up with better results. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, that, that's another, another permaculture principle is, is looking at, um, uh, well, we're talking about growing soil here, or healthy soil, permaculture help, you know, helps soil. One of the things I've done here as well on our property, I'm experimenting with it, it works so well. You know, the fastest way, I think, I think Marjorie Wildcraft first told me this when it really stuck. Um, and, you know, I think she said the fastest way to, to build nutrients into soil is to grow soil. And it's like, that was like that time it really stuck with me. It was like, yeah, you grow it. You don't need to add it and amend it and chop it up and all this stuff. Just plant plants, ground cover, nitrogen fixing plants, you know, filled peas, clovers. Um, there's so many that will go there and, and get their deep tap roots down, bring the nutrients up to the top of the soil, will break up the soil. And the easiest way to do that is, I mean, you can take a, get a bag, a mix of different types of uh, nitrogen fixing seeds, four or five is a, usually a good mix. Um, and the area you want to build up the soil, just go there and scatter the seed all over. You don't have to put them in one by one. Cover it with about uh, an inch of hay, but enough where little light is gonna come through Keep it damp. In about a week, you've got thousands of sprouts coming up. And, um, you know, keep it damp from time to time. And all of a sudden, you're going to have great little plants come up. And what they're doing there is that they're building your soil for you. And it's so easy. You know, it's like it's such an easy thing to do. And you want those plants. You don't want bare dirt. Bare dirt is the worst mm -hmm. thing you can have for, for your land, right? Yeah. And, and along with that... Um like the, the enriching plants. The other thing too is looking at, you mentioned the tap roots earlier, plants that are penetrating, plants that will go into that hard, hard pan for you and break it up. And also considering animals. Um, let me think, it was uh, lost language of plants. They were talking about out west. They said, if you kill the gophers, you're going to bring the drought and people mm. just laugh because the, the native, that was one of the native, they, they laugh. They're like, come on, you know, gophers have nothing to do with rain. Well, turns out they killed the gophers and the droughts did come because the animals naturally will burrow into the soil. That permeability in the soil means the soil breathes and absorb it, it respires more effectively. And it also traps the rain when the rains come and then it helps create uh, you know, the animals carry the seeds down. They plant the seeds. They, they're they part of that ecosystem, you know, from gophers to, you know, ants, termites, other burrowing creatures, the worms, you know, coming up to the top surface of the soil and dragging the, the detritus down and chewing on it. Everything has a function. Everything is part of the system. And I think observation, as you've mentioned repeatedly, is so important. It's like, don't just spray. Don't just kill look it over, try to figure out the relationships and what's going on because it, it all works together if it's working correctly. That, that's a great point too. It's another principle in, in permaculture is, is, you know, balance, keeping things in balance. Mm -hmm. Like if you have too many ants on your property, it's because <laughs> you have an imbalance, right? And so you want to, yeah. you don't want to let them take over everything because they'll, you know, end up mm -hmm. destroying your food. But you don't want to get rid of them completely either because, as you said, they have a mm -hmm. function. So you find out, okay, how do we naturally balance that colony so that it's not taking – they're there in an extreme amount because you're lacking something that keeps them in balance. You know, system is mm -hmm. all about collaborate. I mean, nature, natural systems are all about 
collaboration and symbiosis. They're not about competing against each other. If you ever, you know, you, I mean, you work in permaculture, you work on the land, you work with plants, you recognize how everything is designed to work in, 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 a, in a collaborative relationship, one way or the other, whether it's keeping something in balance or it's supporting something else. And so it's remembering that. We talked earlier about the grasshoppers. I think it was Jeff Lawton that said, you know, you don't have a, you don't have a grasshopper problem if you have tons of grasshoppers coming in and eating everything. You have, a, you have a ground bird problem. You don't have enough ground birds coming in to eat them. So mm -hmm. what do you do? get some ground yeah. birds in there, you know. Get some pheasants, yeah. some fowls, some chickens, that sort of thing. So it's just thinking a little bit differently. But it's also, it also makes life easier because it means you have to do less work. And that's, that's pretty appealing too, you know. Um, yeah, if, if you get it right. If you, yeah. And you get it right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and you, can, you can fail all day long until you get your systems in place. And eventually, you know, you figure it out. And um, and then you make it work, and uh, and it's pretty cool. It's a very creative process, very fun. And I want, like you, just to see more and more people learning about permaculture and getting excited about it and wanting to get it out to you know the mass public. And and this really leads us back to, I think the main point of self reliance is, you know, our food system is like the most insecure system we have in the United States right now. We depend on, you know, next day delivery. Most of our meals travel 1,500 miles to get to our dinner plate using massive amounts of resources. What it really comes down to is inspiring people to go out and start growing their own food. You know, even if it's just a little bit or in a community farm, but going out and doing it and don't doing it the conventional agriculture way. Do it with these kinds of systems. Yeah. It, it becomes well. you can do if you using permaculture. I mean, you don't have to have a hundred and plus acres. You can do it in a backyard. You know, you can use, um, you know, instead of having just decorative things growing, you can change that to food crops, you know. And I think getting out there, getting your hands dirty, working with those food crops, I think is a part of a fundamental part of who we are as people, that it really helps nurture, you know, the soul nurtures your humanity when you know where your food comes from and you, you interact with the soil, the dirt, and you become more aware of the seasons. It, it just, I really think that's part of what's contributing to the eco, epidemic of mental health issues is that we're so disconnected from everything. You were disconnected from the seasons. We're disconnected from our food. And building those connections between our food and, you know, what we grow and what we eat, as opposed to just, you know, buying a package off the shelf, building those connections in our community, you know, because obviously most of us aren't going to be able to grow everything we eat. But if we can source it locally, I, you know, I have made some wonderful friends here over the years. And, you know, my husband talks about moving every time it gets like really nasty cold again. And I'm like, we can't. I, you know, like, I have everything here. I have my friends, right? You know, who have eggs and milk. And I have my grass fed beef guy. And, and, and you know, it, it just restores that balance in our lives as well as in the soil. So I, I think it's really, it all comes together. Right, right. Definitely. So. Um, as we wind down here, I just want to share some resources with, with folks tuning in. Um, your website, of course, is a great resource, commonsensehome.com. I know you've got a new book out, um, Never Buy Bread Again. Definitely encourage yeah. people to take a look at that. Um, also on Facebook, uh, Common Sense Homesteading. Um, and again, that's commonsensehome.com. A lot of great articles, videos, resources. There's a great ebook there. And I'm sure you'll be putting out a lot more stuff on permaculture from, from here on out, yeah? It's a work in progress. So, yeah, I've got lots more growing, experimenting, learning to do, and we we'll share it, you know, the good, the bad, and sometimes the ugly online. So, <laughs> Nice. Yeah, some other great resources. You know, Jeff Lawton, uh, G-E-O-F-F, -F, Jeff Lawton. He's, you know, kind of one of the world-leading, you know, permaculture educators. Great person to learn from. Sep Holzer, we talked about, um, Paul Wheaton, um, let's see, who else? Uh, some of the people you talked about, Matt Powers and some of these folks. So I mean, you Justin. Can just, oh, Justin Rhodes, exactly. And watch yeah. that interview on, on this summit. I mean, these are all great resources. You just, just keep learning. I mean, there's so much, you, you learn a dozen things in permaculture, 
go implement them. There's a dozen more to learn and a dozen more and a dozen more. It just can go on indefinitely, which is fun, you know. Um, or you can make it simple and just do a few things and that's going to make a difference too. So definitely encourage you to keep that education part of it going. And, um, and also, uh, the other website I want to share with you is uh, the selfrelianceSummit.com forward slash upgrade. So there should be a button on this page somewhere if you're on the website where you can upgrade and you can own all the Self Reliance Summit uh, uh, videos if you missed any of them during the summit. You know, share it with your friends, help get this information out to as many people as possible. Um, and finally, I want to share Unified Fest. It's a four day transformational festival dedicated to leaving the land better than we found it, celebrating life and unifying humanity. There's permaculture workshops, there's hands on training, there's keynote presentations. Um, actually, Paul Wheaton's going to be there doing a keynote presentation. Um, hilarious, hilarious guy, one of the most hilarious guys I, I've ever met and uh, incredibly brilliant. A um, lot of great music, a lot of great networking communities to connect with and it's in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So I'm encouraging everyone to take a look at Unify Fest. It's unifyfest.com. Come out and join us in uh, what they call the land of enchantment, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, other than that, Lori, this has been wonderful. It's always great to connect with you. I appreciate all that you're doing uh, through your work, your website, your writings. And um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. So thank you. Oh, so good to be here. And hopefully we'll be back again next year, right? Awesome. <laughs> Definitely. So uh, thank you all for tuning in. And we'll talk to you on the next interview. Take care. Okay.